All right, thank you, Steve. As I said, my name is Nathan Harris, and I'm going to take us through the first part of our mission architecture. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the fine team whose work is represented directly in these following slides. Next. And here is a nice picture of our orbiter vehicle. Uh, the requirements of the orbiter were to accomplish most of the science requirements of the RFP, which includes uh, delivering the probe to Uranus. It also does remote sensing of the planet, of its moons, and the ring system. Next slide. Uh, here's a map breakdown of the orbiter vehicle. As you can see, there are a few columns here. The first one is the current best estimate. And what that represents is, to our current knowledge, how much does the entire spacecraft weigh, broken down by subsystem. Then we have a margin applied. That margin that you see there is the average of the margin applied to each component within each subsystem. Uh, and that was chosen based on how well we knew that component. So we have a total uh, spacecraft margin of about 10%, just under 10%. And that gives us our design mass of 1,623 kilograms. Uh, the available mass for the launch vehicle is 1,660 kilograms. And some of that was withheld as the high-level systems engineering uh, uh, contingency and the rest was allocated as shown in the final right column as allocated mass for each subsystem. And this was uh, something that was used to trade mass around and uh, make sure that we were always going to fit in our launch vehicle. So the propulsion mass there is, is that? That is the dry mass. Okay. Yeah. So the, the launch mass you're shooting for is what? Uh, we'll see that in a minute. It's um, coming up pretty soon. So, is the margin of reading the subsystems have to the estimate? Or do they have to the estimate? Uh, the estimate, I'm not sure I understand your question. Some people will say, here's my best estimate, here's how much I can do contingency, and here's the margin I have now. Some people say, here's my estimate, Here's my margin against it. Hands on. Okay, we went with the, the second school of thought, which is each subsystem would say, here's my best estimate, and here's how much margin I'm applying on that. They did not apply a contingency also. The contingency was only applied at the system's level. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So, that the instruments are all existing instruments? Yes, they're all legacy instruments from previous NASA missions. So why does that have the, the biggest margin of any subsystem on the Well, maybe someone from instruments could better answer this question. Why is there uh, so much margin on the instrument subsystem? So for that one, I believe the margin comes from the magnetometer. That one provides by the cost of and we don't really find any uh, good, good steps. Did, did you say it again? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm from the instruments team. Okay. Um, I believe the margin comes from the magnetometer boom that was not provided by the customer. Uh, and so, and since we couldn't really find any uh, good information stack on that mass on the boom, we put a uh, Margin on the, uh, so, so the boom is considered part of the instruments, not part of the structure? I believe so, yeah. So this, uh, but you've got like six or seven instruments, it, yeah. and the boom can possibly have enough mass to cover that margin. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, that's the concern I think on the group is, is that your, your most uh, mature technologies, which are the instruments that have flown and have been given you, are the ones that you've got the left for the largest margin. I, 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 would, I, would stay, I, would, I would state it the other way around. If you really need that much margin for the instruments, the rest of your numbers are probably woefully small. So, so how about this question to the group is, how did you determine your margin? 
So we had a scale that we devised <coughs> at the beginning of the year uh, where uh, we had uh, different levels of margin that could be applied uh, based on the knowledge of that system. So uh, we classified things as uh, very well known or uh, some analysis done, uh, maybe it's been flown before, so we have uh, the mass of the thing, but maybe you don't know the attachment for it or whatever. Um, and then the, the we applied a 25% margin to things that we really just had a, a guess for. Uh, I think that's the, the highest margin that's applied to anything uh, now at this point. So what's it? Can I do one more thing? Yeah. So, so let's be specific about it. Power, you've got a 4% power on margin. How did you apply power on ASRGs that have not flown, haven't finished the life test, aren't done with development, and have no history whatsoever in a 4% system margin? I'd like to pass this question on. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is just yeah. based. Hi, um, my name is Noel Las Pinas, and I'm part of the power team. We based off the specs provided in the interface control document that we obtained from JPL that um, pertains to the potential characteristics of the flight-ready ASRGs. So, so what's, what's the basic mass of the ASRG? Um, 23 kilograms plus the ACU, so approximately 30-ish kilograms. And there are three of them, right? Yes. So it's 90 kilograms? Yes. Plus the power electronics. So 25% of 90 is? 25% of 90, that's yeah. approximately yeah, around yeah. 20 kilograms. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's another 25 kilograms. You don't, you don't have that much in your whole subsystem. I mean, I mean I'm assuming you apply 25% margin to that. 25% margin to the ASRGs? Yeah. No, we just applied 4% to the overall masses that we obtained. What, what, what Nathan told us is you guys went and looked at every component and you used this, this table that you, or um, this, this system that you devised, right? I just clarify. Um, so okay. each component was given a margin based off of the standard that Nathan told you. This uh, is an average of uh, the margin in, for all the components within the subsystem. Right. So something, some things were given a higher margin and some things were given a much lower margin. Okay. So what margin did you apply within that subsystem? What margin did you apply to the, the ASRG system? 3%. Three percent. If I remember correctly from the um, from our component spec sheet. I don't remember exactly right now, but I can look it up for you. Okay. So we need to we'll, we'll take an action on that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's Are you gonna write the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll take it back on that. Yes. Go out and measure real easy. You got to design it, lay it up. You got to do bend loops. It's really got a high degree of uncertainty associated with it. <coughs> so I'm a little bit surprised. Five percent says that you guys got it nailed. You know exactly. That's but true. Uh, the harness has never flown. What's that? The harness has never flown before. I believe what I let me put it in perspective, you guys, before you answer. Okay. Okay. At Laravel, we build pretty similar spacecraft. We know what our com systems look like. We have trouble with the harness mass. That's one of the things that, that gives us the most headaches. So, but now you can go ahead and answer. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe we should just answer for the current best estimate on the harness mass is actually a 75 percent margin built into our current best estimate, and then we have a five percent margin on that. Okay. So there is a 75 percent margin built into that current best estimate because harnessing is hard. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Are there any further questions on this slide? Uh, all right, in that case, let's move on. We have the power budget next. This is a breakdown of how much power each uh, part of the spacecraft uses. You can see our total power is just under 300 watts, and our total available power is just over 300 watts. So we meet that with a little bit to spare um, there. This is for our nominal case. Obviously, there are different modes when we're uh, performing uh, various instrument use and uh, sending data. Uh, next slide. 
And before you, before you get off that, at the stage that, I'm sorry, it's the same sort of question. At the stage that game, it doesn't seem like enough for in fact, just like you're going to ask, but you got consistency on each one of those items based on maturity, and you got margin based on that old low. I mean, you can get anyone in but uh, yeah, I expect to see a lot more margin. I guess, uh, uh, to the power requirements that we obtained from the subsystems okay. and saw if the ASRGs could provide that power at end of life taking into account of degradation. In addition to that, uh, we also looked against the, dis the depth of discharge of the battery okay. to see if they can provide that power as well. So I don't know how obnoxious your customers being about this, mm -hmm. but some customers would look at this and say, it looks like you took 5% against the, the 242. Okay, and some customers would say, well, yeah, the 242 is where you are, but that's going to grow by maybe another 36 uh, watts. Yeah, it's uh, all the other margins. So you probably should really be doing the 5% against the 242 plus all these other things that you're going to tack on, and that's what they'd expect to see. Okay. And you'd end up delivering a little bit less than 5% okay. in that case. So and it's, it's just, you know, how your customers define that requirement. Okay. And I've seen it go both ways. Okay. So thank you for letting me know. Thank you. We'll leave it at that. Okay. I'll let you guys negotiate with your customer. Okay, thank you. I know he wants to do it. Alright, so we move on to our pointing budget. You can see what systems grow our pointing requirements for the ADC system. It's the communications instruments and the pro probe refers to the accuracy required when releasing the probe as a UP plus gear in it. Um, you can see that we achieve the pointing requirements uh, by uh, quite a bit in most cases. Next slide. And here is our... You can actually calculate that accuracy yep. to the to the port. Yeah. So you can actually tell me that you can um, ADC system? Uh, yeah, I'm interested in this. I understand that's probably what MATLAB told you you got, but... Yeah, in, in reality, we probably should have uh, rounded. <laughs> 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 I recognize your MATLAB output better than mine. <laughs> All right, just checking. So moving on to our data budget, uh, this is basically how much of our processor we're using on board. Uh, MIPS refers to million instructions per second. You can see that we are capable of processing quite a bit more than we're actually using. Uh, that gives us margin to play with. Also, it lets us uh, slow down the computer so that we can save power. Next slide. And here is the Delta B budget. 
this is uh, over the entire mission. You can see our launch vehicle exit velocity, and there's the delta V during the transit, uh, which is mainly at the two Earth flybys, which I'll get into in a minute. That's just over one kilometer per second, and captured, which is about two kilometers per second, with an additional 675 meters per second uh, during some final orbit changes at Uranus and for our moon tour. We applied a 7.5% margin to all of our delta V so that we could account for thruster misalignment and uh, perturbations, things that were not included in the analysis. Next slide. Did you build any one of those rows too on top of that, or is that just. Uh, no, there is not. We have a little one that Given the uncertainties of things that happen up there, 30%. The advice we received from our customer was to use 5 to 10% margin on the Delta V. 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 Yeah, it's much better this one. Yeah, so it, I mean, I don't know, one is the 5% thing. That's actually applied to everything. Yeah. Including the capture. Including the capture. Yeah. Well, that's a good part of it. That suggests that you should uh, separate these things a bit. Right? I mean, if you know what it's going to take to capture, and the uncertainties of the delivery are not such that it's going to be 5% of that number. Right? Yeah, so maybe we have more than we need to know. Well, <laughs> okay, let me uh, walk you through how we came up with these numbers. Uh, what you can see here is a screenshot of a MATLAB tool that we created. Initially, as we were designing trajectories, we tried to do a brute force search. Um, then we realized that in order to uh, analyze a four flyby scenario such as what we ended up with, it would take approximately 32 years to compute that way. So instead, we came up with this visual tool that helped us shape the trajectory so it looked good, and then refine our search base and optimize from there. If we go to the next slide. You can see what uh, routes we came up with. We looked at several dozen different trajectories. Um, most of them were absolutely terrible. These are the only ones that are remotely feasible. And as you can see, even the top one there is not really feasible because it requires over six and a half kilometers per second during transit of the flybys. The one we ended up going with is Earth, Venus, Earth, Earth, Saturn, Uranus route. And that takes 16 and a half years. You can see that that route is listed twice on this chart, one with a 16 year, one with a 16 and a half year transit time. And uh, the delta V is higher for the shorter transit time. So it was kind of a trade-off between those two. We ended up choosing the 16 and a half year transit time so that it would give us a larger launch window and uh, more mass to play with throughout the entire space track. Next slide. And where this noise is uh, part of the machine shop, which is also located in this building. I apologize, I'll try to speak up so it doesn't drown us out too much. Um, another tool that we used was STK, or the satellite toolkit. And uh, the aerospace department into the system designed for the Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So we used SDK as a way to kind of check our MATLAB results. What we found is that SDK is really not that good for interplanetary trajectories. Uh, it is very difficult to target flybys, especially more than one. And uh, it really did not find our route very well. Uh, our uh, team spent uh, about five months wrestling with SDK. We finally got some uh, nice animations with the T in a minute, but uh, it didn't work out as well as we hoped. Next slide. So here's a workshop plot of our launch and arrival dates. Launch dates are on the x-axis, and the arrival dates are on the y. So the contours represent the total delta V required for the uh, launch, uh, excess velocity from the launch vehicle, plus transit delta V, plus capture into a nominal electric orbit at your end. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. 
otherwise in a group forest around that date. Yes. So each, each point on this graph represents analyzing several thousand possible trajectories, picking the best one for that launch date and arrival date, and plotting that. And doing that took how long? How much time? Uh, that took uh, about three days. Uh, so I don't understand the horizontal axis, but that looks like uh, 2021. Yes, that's your requirement is December 30th, 2020. Yes, uh, we'll get into that a little more, and Steve mentioned this, but uh, what we do is we're launching the UPS vehicles in 2020, uh, which fulfills our your requirement to have something launched by then. And, uh, A little tiny probe launcher goes first and satisfies the requirement for the mission and a main orbiter, which is your main mission, and where all the pass money is, doesn't satisfy what it goes later and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Next slide, please. What's that? So here's our launch window. Uh, there are two lines in this graph, let me try to explain them. The red line represents the available launch mass based on the seat period required to launch on a particular day. Uh, then the black line represents the wet mass required of the orbiter to achieve the delta V throughout transit and capture. And the blue line represents holding the total spacecraft mass constant, which was a question from before. It's about 7,800 kilograms there. Uh, and Whenever the blue line is above the black line and below the red line is when we can launch. So that gives us a launch window of 34 days. Now, uh, something to point out is that there is only one launch window for the orbiter. Uh, you cannot launch at any other time and make it to Uranus. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to explain why that is. We have several constraints on the orbiter's trajectory. The first one is it has to launch after 2018. Uh, that's the soonest we could possibly uh, build and test a spacecraft like this. The next is to launch before 2020 from the RFP. Um, that was stretched for this vehicle to 2021, uh, but really it doesn't help you launch after that anyway, because the next requirement that we came up with is to do a flyby of either Jupiter or Saturn. This gives you a huge amount of uh, free delta V um, and makes it possible to get out to Uranus. And also we have to do a, a vehicle dry mass of greater than 1,500 kilograms and that really uh, limits how much we can stick on a launch vehicle. Uh, as we'll see later, the UPS vehicles are much lighter than the orbiter and they launch straight out to Jupiter and then to Uranus so they don't have to do these interplanet flybys. Whereas the orbiter is a much more massive vehicle, it needs to do some interplanet flybys so that it can launch uh, with the lower C3 and uh, make it out to your with a high delivered mass. So can the, uh, can the UPSs operate without the orbiter being up there? Yes, they can. So if you miss that, when you say there's only one launch window yes. ever? for this particular design? Yes. Um, so if you have a fleet problem with the, with the launch vehicle, you're sure the thing goes into the museum and you <laughs> Right. Uh, there aren't any other launch vehicles right now that could carry us. There probably will be by the time we're launching. Uh, we could be uh, reconfigured, we could change our uh, our prop system at another stage to fly in a adult in a falcon heavy sorry um, that was also the possibility of the um, uh, space NASA's new giant vehicle yeah, the, starting the, the reality of that is even spaceships. even if you could fly on multiple launch vehicles by the time you get close enough you're already committed to a particular one and if say two months Set with those guys. So 
It's yeah. a that's a from a program success standpoint, that's a sort of one of those questionable risks that's out there, but it is a risk. I mean yeah, and you'll see why it's some of our major ninety five percent of the liabilities invest. So Yeah, I mean I think though that's the reality of of interplanetary trajectories to the outer nights. I mean that's just I don't think they're doing anything that JPL wouldn't do either. And that, well, maybe they're doing a lot of things that you can do. <laughs> but I, I think the reality of being on a um, banking all on one launch vehicle in that window is the way you, the way it is. Did you just put some figure of merit there and what, what JPL would or wouldn't do? Well, I was sitting next to a JPL person, so I made sure I did. <laughs> Incredulous that there isn't a backup opportunity in three or five years or whatever. And has that not been explored? It has been explored extensively. It's possible that with uh, additional design tools that were beyond our uh, capability, uh, such as considering deep space maneuvers, uh, that would give you some more options for trajectories. Um, but really, uh, as you can see here, you have to fly by Jupiter around 2022 to 2023, and Saturn, if you're doing that, uh, 2029 to 2030. Um, if you don't hit that, then you really can't get to Uranus with uh, a system like ours. So uh, in order to do that, we have to do multiple interplanet flybys, <coughs> and it just doesn't work out to do them any other way in order to get to Saturn by that time. <laughs> so, uh, if there aren't any other questions, we'll try to move on uh, to the next slide. And here's our launch. So, we'll be launching on the Delta IV Heavy uh, at Kennedy Space Center with a direct injection and C3 of 10.9 kilometers squared per second squared. The ideal launch date is November 12th and 2021. Next slide. After we launch, we'll separate from the bearing. We'll become free access stabilized off the launch vehicle. Uh, the sun sensors will be used to keep the star trackers from pointing at the sun, and we'll use the Logan antenna to communicate with the Earth. At this point, the thermal skirt, which is at the bottom of the spacecraft, is going to be pointing at the sun. Next slide. Here's an animation of our transit from Earth to Venus. Uh, during this period, we still have the thermal skirt pointed at the sun, and we do daily system checks communicating with the low gain antenna. Next slide. And here's our Venus flyby. Our altitude is about 1,200 kilometers at Venus. We keep the thermal skirt still pointed at the sun, and the probe side of the spacecraft will face the planet. How close are you there? It's about 1,200 kilometers altitude. So if we go on for our next slide, here's our Venus to Earth animation. We're coming in towards our first Earth flyby. Uh, at this point, the thermal skirt is still pointed at the sun, and uh, low gain antenna is still used. As uh, so you see on the next slide, we, well, sorry, one after this, I misjudged. Uh, this is I'll answer that question in a minute. Um, we have to work the spacecraft so that the main thruster is in the anti-ram direction to prepare itself for the burn at Earth, which is roughly 500 meters per second. And then at our next slide, you can see the animation of our Earth flyby. And that's what I think is the money shot. Uh, our altitude of the Earth flyby is approximately 1,200 kilometers. And I know that does sound dangerously low. Um, I'd like to cite that the CME went closer with the morning clear material. Wait, wait, wait. Before you do that, you should look at the look at that launch before a planetary probe was driven into Mars. Which I think would have changed people's view of my Okay, and Cassini had a lot of trouble 
we recognize that there are a lot of uh, limbo issues with this. Um, these are things that uh, could be fully analyzed by our legal team, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going down through the satellite constellations and stuff, yes, that's no problem with that. Yes, um, and we don't know what's going to be up there from now in uh, 20, 23 years ago when this happened. So the next slide. Probably. Uh, for Earth to Earth transit, it's the same orientation, uh, but now we orient the high gain antenna to be pointed at the Earth, and uh, we're going to start powering down a little. Don't need to do our system updates quite as often. We come into our second Earth flyby. Our next slide. This is also a 1,200 kilometer altitude. Uh, we're going to fire up the instruments just before our Earth flyby and take some pictures of the Earth that uh, use that to calibrate the sensors and prove that they work. That we're getting on for uh, most of the mission after that. Next slide. Is that the first time the instruments are powered? Yes, it is. That was your second Earth flyby? Yes. And at that point, the instrument covers come off also. Um, we wanted to make that happen before they had sat in space too long, but um, didn't want to do it too prematurely, uh, so it's kind of a <coughs> there when you take off those covers. So here we are. Okay, Saturn. So what was the last time to the second flyby? Uh, between the first flyby and the second flyby is uh, just over two years. Is there any reason that you didn't do all of your instrument checkouts right away? And well, you want to do still together? Keep the instrument covers on as long as possible. Um, try to increase the reliability of our system by keeping them <coughs> off as long as possible. Although well, you could turn them on and just make sure the electronics are working and you want to avoid contamination. Correct. And if you, you will know if they survived the, the launch environment until two years later. Yeah. Well, contamination is a funny thing because you're talking about one or two years around Earth that you're deciding about, but you've got this huge long transit out to the planet of it's going to dominate the Okay. True, and that's a that's a trade we made, um, and really you could change that without taking anything else on the mission. So we feel it's not a super critical thing at this point. So now we've had our Saturn flyby. Uh, here we are going by. Um, we have the option to do some additional science about Saturn. That's not in the RFP, but if the customer wants to provide the additional ground support to process that data, you can do it very easily. The high gain antenna is pointed at Earth still, and the probe panel is at Saturn. Next slide. And now is our final leg of our journey out to Uranus. The Saturn flyby gave us a significant speed boost. That gives us enough energy to make it to Uranus and uh, we'll start taking pictures of the planet to improve our ephemeris. Um, this is an optical GNC, <coughs> and uh, that helps us refine our capture. And then as we enter the Uranus sphere of influence at our next slide, we do a small correction burn at the sphere of influence that helps us uh, put us directly on an impact trajectory. Um, and that might sound strange, but that's because the probe is going to enter the atmosphere. So we set the orbiter and the probe on the trajectory so they will enter the atmosphere. Then we do a small burn to push the orbiter off of that so we can capture instead. Next slide. And uh, as we do a capture, we need to uh, listen to the probe first. That's a very important part. And then very quickly, we reorient for our main thruster in the RAM direction and we perform a huge turn of two kilometers per second. Next slide. What is that acronym SOI? Uh, sphere of influence. Oh. All right, and here we are at the Uranus system. You can see the moons going around there. Uh, as Catherine said, it has quite a few moons. Uh, the three we're interested in are Miranda, Umbriel, and Oberon. If we go to our next slide, you can see 
see a MATLAB tool that we made to analyze our uh, delta V maneuvers at Uranus. This included the capture and changing the uh, orbit of the uh, orbiter vehicle to match our final operational orbit and get ready for our moon tour. Next slide. So here's a breakdown of the delta V used at Uranus. So if we kind of click through this <coughs> next slide, uh, you can see that first we capture into this extremely elliptical orbit with a period of three to five days. Uh, that's also a very inclined orbit. So next slide. Then we do a burn to change that inclination so that we're just out of the plane of the range so that our moon tour is much easier. And then next slide. We then change our atwaps to shrink that down and shorten the period to uh, 25 days, and that lets us do more passes of the planet and get more data. Next slide. So here's a walkthrough of the moon tour that we designed. Uh, go to the next slide. First you burn to Miranda, and then next slide, Miranda again. Next, go to Umbriel, next, to Oberon, next, Umbriel again, next, and over on again. So this allows us to complete our RFP requirements. We are required to analyze a flyby of each moon twice and uh, leave further calculations up for a, a later date. Next slide. There are some different types of orbits that we'll do at Uranus. This one would be the imaging pass. So as we're coming in close to the planet, we do 12 hours of imaging data. Then we spend the entire rest of the orbit downlinking that data. So we have a period of eight hours to transmit the data, then we recharge the batteries and send more data and keep cycling that until all the data is sent through twice, and by then we are back for another pass. On our next slide, we can see the radio science pass. This has a combination of gravity science and one-way application radio science. Uh, during this time, no data is generated. The only data is from the carrier signal that you're sending to the Earth. Uh, so we don't really have to downlink anything unless we have it stored up from a previous pass. Next slide. And now we can see a uh, moon science pass. This is for the moon tour, as was described earlier. We would uh, burn to uh, rendezvous with the moon, the very low mass relatively uh, to the planet, and uh, we coast to encounter that moon, take some pictures, and then downlink that data for the rest of the orbit. So if there are no more questions on that, I'm going to pass it off to... Well, are you, are you yeah. using gravity assist with those moons? Um, yes, we, we didn't uh, analyze everything we could in the moon steward. Um, we recognize that it's very difficult. So you're doing the thing, in, in your design, you're doing just the, the, the false ability to Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, maybe Max uh, could address that a little better. Um, we did do and analyze the flybys of the moons. However, the masses of the moons are very small in comparison to the mass of Uranus. So the gravitational assist that we get from doing a flyby of the moons is rather negligible. Um, through the model and through the uh, animation, it was taken into account. It's just it's a very small effect. What's, what's your contact frequency with the spacecraft uh, after you do your computer side on? What's your assumption? Uh, hand that off to the comm system. Um, I'm Jay Daniel from the comm system. Uh, we are operating on X-band KA band for this. Um, the data will primarily be sent down on KA band at 32 gig. Yeah, but I, I guess often, yeah. Oh, okay. how often? Yeah, ground contact. Yeah. Um, while we were out at Uranus, um, we have 28 uh, ground passes, each eight hours long, um, for our 25 day orbit. Um, in transit, it's less frequent than that. Obviously, we have less data to get down. Um, and we don't need to use all 28 of those ground passes. Okay. Let me restate my question. It's the, the period between your Jupiter flyby and, and arrival to Uranus is. Ten years or somewhere around well, there. Previously, Saturn that, flyby. I'm sorry, Saturn. During that time period, you know, how often do you expect to have communication with the spacecraft in the ground? You know, it's going to be on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, on a monthly basis. Yes. 
monthly. Um, when uh, around Saturn, though, um, we are increasing our downlinks. Um, we have um, data that we're collecting at Saturn. We also have uh, obviously quite a bit of uh, ranging information we didn't have before and after Saturn in order to know our trajectory. Does that answer your question? Say that again. Have you analyzed the best you can to do this question without a battery? Uh, we do have batteries. I mean, and we'll, no, but can, can you eliminate the battery? Oh, can you eliminate that? Um, I don't know. Can we leave that discussion until the power subsystem later right. on? There's a mission guy, right? Okay, yes. Well, yeah, we can, but I, I just want to know if you. Uh, we. You I'm sure we could. If you don't need them. Um, it lets us downlink uh, uh, higher data rates. Um, what, what power do you use for power? Power would you like to? Um, we could this? add on a fourth ASRG to take care of the power requirements during transmit. Of course, that especially at the beginning of life, you're going to have to shunt away significantly more amount yeah. of power. Where should we put that? So, um, any more questions? All right, I'll hand it off to Kalakai Lipperletti, who will take you through the mission architecture with the UCFD.